Erica, the Associate Director at Last Rights. Joining us today is exhibiting artist Sarah Jonkis. Welcome, Sarah, and thank you for joining us today. And thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. We thought this would be a great opportunity for everyone to learn a little bit more about the artist behind the painting on a personal level. Tell us how you found working with darker images and themes at Last Rights. I usually find it to be an opportunity um, to not feel as restricted as I might at other shows. Um, some galleries don't appreciate the darker work, um, but it generally seems to be well suited for me and where I feel most comfortable. And uh, over the years, my work has only continued to get darker and darker, so uh, it's good for me. It's, uh, it's where you know, I'm happy to be. So. Great. We always love showing dark art and love to be the venue for that. Mm -hmm. Taking Over is the title of your exhibition at Last Rites. Tell us a bit more as far as how you decided upon that title and what it means to you. Um, well, I struggle a lot with the titles for uh, my paintings and my shows. Uh, generally, like I'm not sure how to kind of step out of myself and judge it objectively um, to know if it sounds corny or not. Um, so I ended up settling on the title for the show, Taking Over. Um, it was inspired by the song uh, Over by Portishead. Um, there's some themes going on in that song that really relate to the things I was dealing with in my art for the show. Um, so it worked well. There's kind of like this uncertainty and fear and this feeling of being taken over by something dark. Um, I was also tossing around Bad Moon Rising, but I couldn't settle on it in the end, and I thought taking over was a bit more iconic. So. I think it fits your work very, very well for this exhibition. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, it's great. In past and current bodies of work, I've noticed song lyrics, sayings, and pop culture references as many of the titles of your pieces. Do these mainstream idioms influence you prior to painting, or do they serve as an afterthought? Uh, well, I do like using a lot of idioms and lyrics uh, for titles to my work, obviously the title of the show. <laughs> um, I think uh, it kind of adds to the painting in a way that kind of helps people, you know, get uh, open to interpretation on it, or maybe kind of a little hint as to what I was going with with the work. Um, but I also, during my painting process, I listen to a lot of music, and a lot of it influences me. Uh, so in a way, it's almost like crediting the music or whatever it is that I was uh, inspired by. Um, as far as the titling, though, um, I usually come up with it you know, after completion of the work. It's not often something that I predetermine along the way. So, yeah. Do you find that sometimes titles come during the process? It has, yeah, it's as rare, well. but it does happen. and. Uh, I, I kind of like it when it does happen because I don't have the stress afterwards of worrying like, okay, what, what title can I come up with that's not corny sounding? So, you know, it's, it's nice when it happens. The animal kingdom is a very prominent aspect of your work, in particular amphibians, insects, and birds. Is this intentional and what role do these animal kingdoms play within your work and for you? Well, you know what, I, I grew up uh, with a, a big interest in uh, reptiles and insects. And you know, on rainy days when I was a kid, I'd go out to the garden and I'd collect all the slugs and the uh, uh, potato bugs. I'd put them in a bucket and I'd have them in my room, probably, to my mother's dismay. And I used to collect frogs and snakes and stuff, too, so I think that probably lingered into my work a little bit. But as far as um, the benefit of it to my work, I think they're very uh, delicate and elegant at the same time as bringing a bit of creepiness to the work and adding to it that way. Um, all the animals that I tend to choose, though, are highly symbolic and either have like a literary or um, a biblical or um, mythological kind of undertone and it kind of adds to them as well. While we're talking about animals, did you have any pets growing up? Uh, yeah, I had a ton of pets growing up, especially cats. We had a lot of cats. <laughs> you know, um, there's a lot of strays in our neighborhood too, so we took them in often. Um, but I also had like, hamsters and guinea pigs and hermit crabs and at one point we had a dog um, for maybe a year. He wasn't ours, but, um, but it was a good experience and I look forward to possibly having a dog later on in life. So. And do you have any pets now? Uh, yes, I have two cats who I love very much. <laughs> and if you could have any pet in the world, what would it be? Um, well, I guess I would kind of... I have this odd fantasy about uh, working at a llama farm when I'm older, <laughs> like kind of a simple life. Um, I'm not really planning on it, and it's probably not something that I'm going to end up doing, but uh, I always find llamas very charming and hilarious to be around, so you know, I have one animal that really makes me happy. <laughs> so, it's really so definitely. Fun. Fun. Yeah. Cool. Many of your paintings exude a melancholic loneliness, as if the figure being portrayed were the last one on Earth. Is this intentional? And I also have to ask how you believe the world would end. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's intentional. Um, I've always enjoyed kind of melancholy and dark images. And I find them kind of beautiful and romantic in an unconventional way. 
Um, but I also think more so than my work dealing with interrelationships, it's been about uh, identity and personal struggle. And uh, I like the feeling or the image of somebody kind of going under a dramatic change. So it, it works well. And then uh, the apocalyptic undertone as well. Um, I was, I've always had kind of dreams that were a bit <laughs> apocalyptic, even when I was a kid, you know, like lava coming down on the house and stuff. So, you know, it's uh, maybe it's just a part of my nature a little bit. As far as uh, the world ending for us, if it's not at our own hands, I would think we'd probably go out like the dinosaurs and something dramatic and <laughs> out of our control. But, yeah, hopefully uh, I don't see that. <laughs> I hope none of us No, do. no, I hope 2012 coming up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And if there was one final painting you would do before the world would end, let's say tomorrow, what would it entail? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I guess it would be apocalyptic, but I mean, if my work already is in that vein, right? Um, but uh, I have a, uh, like a list of at least 30 paintings in my sketchbook I want to do, wow. so I couldn't settle on one and you know you get working on something and it, it either works to what your image or illusion of what it was or it doesn't kind of, you know, doesn't go where you want it to go. I don't know how else to <laughs> say it, sorry. Um, the apocalypse is quite prominent within the subcultures of anime and science fiction and sometimes video games. Many people may not know, but you are a fan of these three subcultures. I am too, so I have to ask who your favorite fictitious character is. Uh, well, I, I couldn't choose like an absolute favorite, but if I were to settle on somebody, it would probably be uh, Rei and Ami from Neon Genesis Evangelion. Uh, I was always kind of attracted to the more distant and muted characters, and I like kind of the internal struggle that she had going on, and there seemed like, like a mysterious story behind those type of characters. Um, but also she kind of had this existential angst, like she didn't know um, what reality was or what it meant to be human. Um, so I like those kind of uh, social empathy sort of themes in, in uh, science fiction. Might be why I like Rachel from Blade Runner so much <laughs> too. So yeah. The painting Take by Storm is rather mysterious and alluring. What does this piece mean to you? Uh, the painting uh, Take by Storm uh, for me was about uh, taking a stance against decadence and uh, indulgence and kind of highlighting my concerns for uh, our over-consuming culture and where that may take us. Um, rather than kind of building a really elaborate narrative, I like the idea of using um, a simple and kind of imaginative portrait to uh, convey those themes almost in satire. Um, the, the atmosphere of the painting is kind of very threatening and sinister as well as the character, and I think this kind of plays with those themes well on its own. Um, but I also kind of like the, the evil Audrey Hepburn thing that she has going. It was kind of fun to play with that, so it, it probably ended up being my favorite painting from the show. What do you have planned for your next body of work? Are there any new themes you'll be exploring? Actually, I have a bit of time before my next uh, big show, so it's, uh, it's good to have a bit of space to kind of think things over since the last three years. It's been like two solo shows every year. Um, at the moment, I'm still carrying on uh, a sort of apocalyptic or kind of find this kind of balance between being too obvious or being too subtle with my work. So uh, it's been a bit of a ride with that, but I think <laughs> I'm starting to kind of get it uh, nicely there. And, um, yeah, I'm excited about the work, but I don't actually have the, the plan to tell you at the moment. So it's more exciting that way though, right? It's more mysterious. <laughs> we look forward to hearing more about it when we do get some ideas. Thank you. You're welcome. We took the liberty of asking some fans to submit any questions that they may have for you. One of which asks, what other career path would you pursue if you did not become an artist? Uh, this is actually, a, it's a good question for me because I think about it often. You know, as an artist, you're always wondering if your career is going to work out for you and what will you do if it doesn't. Um, but uh, probably not something I can go back on, but I always like the idea of working with animals or maybe being a, a zoologist or um, like a, a marine biologist or something that way. Uh, but uh, maybe personality-wise, I couldn't even get past the dissecting of a frog in you know, grade 11, so it might not have been good. Um, also, probably would like being a musician, you know, maybe like a celloist or a violinist or something. It would have been fun. And here's our Paul Booth question that we ask all our artists. If you can dig up an artist from the past and consume their brains, who would it be and why? <laughs> who would a zombie attack? Um, well, I guess I admire Andrew Wyeth enough to want to eat his brains and gain his knowledge. Uh, you know, not just because of his skill, because like, he's an amazing realist, um, incredible painter, 
Uh, but there's this real psychological undertone to all of his work that I love and, you know, really plays at my heartstrings. So he's got that perfect kind of skill and emotion to it that uh, I admire. Well, Sarah, thank you for joining us today. All of your fans, as well as ours, appreciate getting into your head a little bit. Well, thank you for having me. This has been a good experience. So very happy to be here. <laughs>